pretty cool. Okay, last time we were talking about options, and we said the option was the right but not the obligation to do something. And we said that we have these options that allow us to buy an asset. What were those called? Yeah, they're called, well, I, I said to, uh, the option to buy an asset. Oh, yeah, it's a call. What about the option to sell an asset? It's a put, right? Okay, so there are two parties in every one of these transactions. There are, there are the people selling the option, and they receive a premium in, ex in return. And then there are the people that are buying the option. Only the people who are buying the option have the right, but not the obligation. The other party has the obligation to do whatever the other, whatever the buyer demands, right? And that's why you're getting that premium. You're putting yourself at the mercy of this individual in exchange for money. Kind of like I am right now. I'm putting myself at the mercy of you guys in exchange for a paycheck from the university. Okay. Now, let's talk about, we said last time that there are actually two pieces. And, and we started off talking about the intrinsic value of the option. And the reason, if you go back and you look at the value of the option, those were all at expiry. There was no time left in the option's life. And so all the value was intrinsic. But there is also this speculative value. And a speculative value is all about uh, paying for the possibility that this stock, if it's a call option, that the stock might go up. Or if it's a put option, that the stock might go further down. And so that's why we have the speculative value. <clears throat> that's why if your option has any time at all left on it, it's never optimal to exercise the option. You'd be better off to sell the option to someone else. Because if you exercise it, all you get is the intrinsic value. If you sell it, you get the intrinsic plus the speculative value. Okay, any questions so far? By the way, the intrinsic value, it's the, that max formula that we used earlier. Max for calls, it's uh, the stock price minus the exercise price, and for puts, it's the exercise price minus the stock price, or zero, whichever is larger. So let's talk about selling. We just talked about this. The seller has the obligation. They don't have any option here. They, are, they have sold their rights to someone else. They've put themselves at the mercy. And what is in exchange for that? They get the option premium. So now, we earlier we looked at the payoffs and profits from buying options. Now we're going to look at the payoffs, and we'll, we'll verbally walk through the profits of uh, selling these. And so let's think about if you sell an option, what are the payoffs? Well, if the stock price stays below the exercise price, then the payoff is zero. But if the payoff, or if the stock price goes above the exercise price, for every dollar it goes up, your payoff drops by one. By the way, the payoff here is negative because if I tell someone that I will, um, I will sell them this stock at at $50 a share and the stock goes to 62, I've actually lost 12 bucks there because I could have sold the stock for 62 if I hadn't promised that I would sell it for 50. And so that's why this payoff becomes negative when the stock price goes above the uh, exercise price. Now, if I sold this for $10, what would my profit be when the stock price is $20? I sold it for 12. I sold it for 10. Oh, 10. Sold it for 10 bucks. What would my profit be at stock price of 20? Well, the payoff is zero. Go ahead. No. And remember, I sold this option. I received $10 for having done so. Yeah, so my profit is going to be 10 all the way up until 50. And then after that, my profit drops by $1 for every dollar the stock price goes up above the strike price. 
And so when do I break even on this thing as far as I'm, I'm not making any money, but I'm not losing any money? Yeah, it's 60 because for every, you've, you've gotten rid, you've had a $10 loss on the payoff, but you had a $10 gain on the premium. And so you add those together and you get zero. Beyond that, you are losing money. Beyond that, you are losing money. Now, uh, let's talk about the potential uh, losses for selling a call auction. In theory, how high can stock prices go? Infinite. And so if you've got an infinite uh, stock price on this thing, infinity minus 60 is your loss. Now, if you didn't own that stock, you're going to be in a world of hurt. And so we actually, let's see if I put it on here or not. No, I did not. Okay, so there are two ways to sell call options. Naked and covered. Folks, this is about as exciting as it gets in finance. We actually use the word naked. Right? Okay, so what is a naked call? If I don't actually own the underlying stock and I sell the call option, then I'm exposing myself to these potential infinite losses that I can't cover. Does that make sense? So, how do I protect myself? Well, what I do is I actually buy the underlying stock. So, options, and you need to write this down too. Options come in contracts for 100 shares. Options come in contracts for 100 shares. So, if I'm going to sell calls, I'm gonna sell covered calls, which is where I own the underlying stock, then I need to go out and buy stock in increments of $100 so I can sell a contract on each of those $100, or 100 shares, sorry, 100 shares. And so I actually used to do this back in 1998 when I thought I was smart. Um, I actually got into options trading. And uh, my first experience with options was buying call options on my own company. And um, the stock price shot up. Now here's the fun thing. If I spend $2 on the option and the stock price shoots up by five, uh, above the, the or actually if it just shoots up by five, because then I just turn around and sell the option for five more dollars, so I've got a profit of three bucks there. But think about that in percentage terms. Isn't that an amazing? So this is why if you had inside information about a company, you don't buy the stock, you buy the call options because you can buy a boatload more call options, right, than you can shares. Now, should you be trading on inside information? No, it's immoral, it's illegal, it's wrong. Don't do it. Okay, but that's why you see all these people that get caught. Uh, typically, they're not buying shares, they're buying options. Okay, so here's what I did. And by the way, I was not operating on inside information, but I did buy call options for my own company, which is probably suspicious to the SEC. But uh, the stock price goes up. I made 55% in two days. And I thought, you know, I'm not a greedy man. And I sold it. And then I, I watched the, the stock price keeps going up. And so I'm like, mm, and I jumped back in. And over the next three days, I lost every single bit of money that I had made over the first two days. And so that was, uh, that was a, a cheap lesson to me, right? I'm not that smart. Okay, so then I get to reading. How can I basically do call options in a way that won't risk me losing, in effect, really losing money? And the answer was to do this thing of selling covered call options. And so what I did is I went out and I looked for a stock that had a low price per share that um, people were interested in buying call options on it. And this, the symbol was GE in the, I don't even know if this country, country is still around, Gene. 
and it was selling for $7 a share. And so I go out there and I buy 100 shares. And so now I've got $700 investment, but what does it allow me to do? It allows me to sell these options on that 100 shares and then I wait for them to expire if I don't get called out. In other words, if the stock price didn't take off and go crazy, then what can I do again? I can just keep, I can just keep selling these covered calls, right? And so this is actually, um, as long as you don't mind missing out on the upside, it's a great way to get yourself some income on your portfolio. Now, what if someone, what if the stock price just goes through the roof, someone could call you out, you would miss out on gains. And that's what we're talking about here with this huge, potentially infinite loss. Okay, so I did that for a while and then I get bored. I get bored. And the stock's still trading around $7 a share. And so I thought, you know, I'm not a greedy man. Uh, I'd be willing to sell this stock for a 200% profit. Not a greedy man. Okay, so what do I do? I go out and I put in a market order to sell my stock for $21 a share. A market order. When the stock hits a certain price, then the stock sells. And I do it, nothing happens. I do it, nothing happens. I do it, and I've even forgot about it at this point. And then I get an email from, back then it was just Ameritrade, and it says, your stock is sold. And I'm like, yay, 200%, 200%. And then it says, the sales price was 22. I'm like, yeah, way to go TD Ameritrade. They got me an extra dollar. They're my friends. And then something hit me. Why in the world would I get an extra dollar? So I go out and I look at the stock price. It was $106. Wow. Now, let's think about the name of this, this firm, GE&E. They were doing biotechnology stuff. And, you know, they, they found the cure for something, like super herpes, I don't know. But, so they found the cure, and the stock price just whoo, through the roof. Now, I could look at it as if I gained $15. But in reality, I lost 84. Now, why did I get the 22 instead of the 21? Because the stock was going up so fast that when TD Ameritrade hit the button, it, by the time it actually, the transaction actually happened, it was up to 22. Okay, so there's your, your uh, covered call story. Any questions? Okay. Now, here are the put option payoffs. And this is the, the option, the uh, selling a put. So if we start over here, and we start working our way down. The payoff to this thing is zero all the way down to the exercise price. But after that, if you sell a put, for every dollar it goes below the exercise price, your payoff is minus one dollar more. And so, at least over here, we have a limit to our losses. The worst this payoff's ever gonna be is minus 50. Can you see that? That's because the stock can't go any lower than zero. And so at least it's not as dangerous to sell puts as it is to sell calls, especially naked, right? Naked calls are extraordinarily dangerous. Okay, now let's think about what the profit would be here. If I sell the option for $10, when the stock price is 100, what is my profit? Mr. Bauer. $10. Yeah, 10 bucks. And when the stock price is 80, what's my profit? $10. $10. When the stock price is 50, what's my profit? Still. Still $10. Now, when it drops down to 49, my profit goes to 9. When it drops to 48, and so forth, uh, I lose another dollar. So, where, uh, Ms. Volkova, where is our break even point for this one? Yeah, 40, because then that $40 negative payoff, or the $10 negative payoff is exactly identical to our $10 premium. We broke even. Anything, if the stock price goes any lower than 40 bucks, we start to lose money. 
Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I did not draw the profit diagrams for these, but it would be easy enough for you to do. Now, let's talk about how you buy and sell options. It's the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. They have a lovely website, or at least they did in 1998 when I used to play with these things. Um, and they have these quotes. And this, there's a lot of information here. First of all, they put the, up here on the top that it has a strike price of 135. How do we know? You can see that column that says strike. Do you see that? And you're going to have options of different strike prices. They're not all going to be the same strike price. But you're going to see them distributed about the current stock price because there's a chance the stock could go up, a chance the stock could go up and down. So you're going to see them distributed around the current stock price. In fact, the current stock price you can see right now is 138 and a quarter. And because this is all the same underlying stock, that's the same for each one of these options. And then we have expiry. And so we see there are different months here to expiry. And so let's take a look at um, the, the first two. We've got uh, call options, uh, one strike at 130, or actually the first two are strike at 130, one expires in October, the other one in the following January. These two have exactly the same intrinsic value. Can you see that? Because the intrinsic value of a call is the maximum of the stock price minus the exercise price or zero. Stock price here is 138 and a quarter and we're subtracting 130 so each of these have an intrinsic value of $8.25. So what does that mean? The speculative value is for the October option. Mr. Scott. Can you repeat the question? Okay, so we know this thing has an intrinsic value of $8.25. It's just $138.25 minus $130, which is the strike price. So that's the intrinsic value. We can tell from the quote that this thing is selling for 15 and a quarter. So if the total price of the option is $15 and a quarter, and the intrinsic value is $8 and a quarter, how much is the speculative value? 15 and a quarter minus 8 and a quarter. Yes, and you can't do that math in your head? What's 15 minus 8? Uh, you can do that math in your head. <laughs> All right. Okay, now, what about the intrinsic value of the January option? Well, we've got 19 and a half minus 8 and a quarter. I'm going to ask Ms. Volkova since they're not even money here. How much is the in uh, the speculative value of that one? Uh-huh. How about eleven and a quarter? Eleven. Eleven and a quarter. Mm. Very good. <laughs> okay. So do you see how this works? And why does the January have a higher speculative value than the October? It's because it's further out there's a greater chance that that stock could go up in that extra, how many months is that, three? In that extra three months, there's this greater chance that this uh, stock price is gonna go up. And so that's why people are willing to pay more for the one that expires later. Now, what about the put options? By the way, if the intrinsic value of the call options is positive, what does that mean about the intrinsic value of the put options? Or I could put it another way. Are the put options in the money? No. And so this 130 strike price is down here. This stock's going to have to drop eight and a quarter before this becomes even break even. It has to go below uh, 130 for this thing to be in the money. And so every single bit of the value we see on these puts is speculative value. Every single bit that we see on these puts is speculative value because they are out of money. So if we look at the price of an option and that option is out of the money, then the value, the intrinsic value of the option is how much if the option's out of the money? Zero, right? Because we get this max or zero, max of something or zero. If it's out of the money, it's always zero. And so every single thing up here has to be speculative value. 
And once again, we see the speculative value is uh, greater for the one that has a longer time to expiry because there's more time for bad crap to happen and for this option to become in the money. So people are willing to pay more for that. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's see what else I can show you here. Um, so out of all these options, which one, which, uh, ex, which strike and expiry appears to be the most popular? The red one. The red one. He's absolutely right. How, do you, how can you tell other than the fact that it's red? The volume. Yeah, look at the volume. This is, uh, this is the activity on this thing and more people, in fact, I think it's outstanding. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot more interest in that one than others. And why might that be? Well, for one thing, that 135 strike price is closer to the current stock price. That would be one thing I would tell you, that the interest tends to go away the further away you get from the stock price. Let's see, what else can I take? Oh, by the way, let's say you wanted to go out and buy a contract uh, for call options, the October 130 call option. How much would you have to spend? How much is, what is the, the quote there for the October 30 call? 15 and one quarter. 15 and one quarter. But we know that contracts for options are sold how? 100 shares. So how much money are you going to need to play this game? Yeah, 1525 bucks. Now, this is a rookie mistake lots of people make when they first start doing options. They think, aha. Uh -huh, the quote is per share. So all I have to do is uh, buy, you know, let's, let's say I want to do 10 shares of this. So what do they do? They go out and put it in an order for 10 on the options. Oh yeah. How many shares do they actually, or how many shares have they actually got options on now? Thousand. You better pray that the price doesn't move the wrong way before you figure that out and get out of your position, right? Does that make sense? My roommate did that. And on GameStop, uh -huh. and like he just got lucky. He didn't mean to do that. Like he knew what he was doing. He just messed up, and he made like ten grand, like extremely fast. Yeah, and do you know what that also means? He could have lost yeah. ten grand yeah. extremely <laughs> fast. He knows that. Yeah. So remember that um, these are all zero sum games. And so if I if if he, if so if he jumped on that and made ten thousand bucks, what does that mean? Someone else did. Lost, lost ten thousand bucks, and I'm glad that he recognizes that it could have gone the other way, right? He didn't mean to; he just accidentally did it. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> you should not trade when you are drunk, or high, or late at night, right? And there are all sorts of things when your mind not might not be quite right. Girlfriend just broke up with you. Don't go trade. Does that make sense? If you're emotionally or cognitively uh, messed up, don't go trade. In fact, I would tell you not to trade at all, but you know that's me, right? What's my, go ahead. Well, I'm wondering, you said you haven't done options since 1998. Correct. So why did you stop doing options? Oh, um, well, so the covered calls, you, you think about the, the per hour cost of doing that, I just got bored. But you, if, you, if you're if you like a really lame person that just likes to like spend a lot of time at your computer and do such things, feel free, right? But it's like the value of your time put into it. Yeah, I just got tired of it. So, by the way, you might find this really odd because I'm a finance professor, but I'm really not money driven. You know, if, if they stop paying me, I stop showing up, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, my, my father-in-law, he says to me, he says, you know, you could be making a whole lot more money if you'd stayed in industry. I say, hey, I'm doing okay. He's like, yeah, I get that. But you could be making a whole... I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. So uh, it wasn't worth it to me. But, you know, it's not like I was putting a huge amount of value on my time back then. It was that, uh, you know, what I was getting out of it wasn't doing stuff for me. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. There's, so uh, the, in finance, we have the efficient market hypothesis which makes the assumption that prices react as if the traders were all rational. Raise your hand if you're rational. 
I'm pleased that you guys either are not listening or you don't or you uh, understand this. Well, that's the one thing they do teach you in economics. Oh, good. Yeah. So we talk about rational no actors. One's rational. No one's rational. Now, on average, uh, our, our actions appear to be rational because we've got net jobs over here and we've got net jobs over here, and it kind of balances out, right? But uh, in and of it yourself, when you start looking at your choices that you make, are they always necessarily rational? No. Sometimes you just get tired of doing stuff. I knew a psychotherapist, he had the whole MD thing and everything. He quit and opened a donut shop. Now, if you're just looking for pure rationality, that's not it. Made a lousy chili dog, too. Okay. Because that's what they served at lunch, chili dogs. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, now we're going to move on to something amazing. It's called put call parity. Do you see that formula at the top of the screen? This would be a yes. If not, we need to get your eyes checked, right? Okay. Do you think that formula should be on your note sheet? Yes. Absolutely, it should be. Absolutely, it should be. Now, uh, it looks kind of uh, like a foreign language, so let me explain to you what this means. What do you think P stands for? Price. Price of what? Stock. No. Swing and a miss. The put option value. P is the put option value. So P is the market value of the put option at time zero. Now, what do you think? I'm going to give Mr. Green a chance to redeem himself. What do you think S of zero? Oh, damn. What does E stand for? No idea. See, if you'd show up for class, you'd know these things, right? Yeah. Folks, what's the other letter we use for strikes just for Mr. Green's uh, edification? K. K. We use a K for strike to be the other one. And why do we use a K for strike? Baseball. 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 All right? Okay. Got you got it down now. Okay, let's give, give you one more time. Uh, what do you think S of zero is? No idea. Oh my goodness. Mr. Taylor, you look like you have the answer. What do you think S is really? A stock? Yeah, it's a stock price at times zero. And I think maybe Mr. Russell Wogwood knows what C sub zero is. I have no idea. You, oh, okay, so let's walk through this. We've already talked about the value of a put option. We talked about the stock price. Put options, what's the other kind of option? There's two kinds. Option. Yeah, two kinds of options. What's the other? Call. Yeah, call. And so C sub zero is the value of the call option at time zero. Okay. Now, I'm going to give Mr. Green one more chance. Oh, please don't. <laughs> I've used all my chances today. Oh, but I think, hopefully, because I just told you this answer not like 30 seconds ago. Uh, what does E stand for? Crap, Ms. Avila. Yeah, exerciser strike price. It's the exerciser strike price. Okay, what do you think R is? It is, but it's a special rate of return. It's the risk free rate. It's the risk free rate. What do you think T is? Time. So that's the amount of time between now and the expiry, the expiration of the option. Now, what do you need to know here? You need to know that your R and your T need to be in the same time scale. If your R is on a daily basis, T is the number of days. If your R is on a quarterly basis, T is the number of quarters, and so forth. Okay. So, what does this mean? It means that the payoff from buying a put option and the stock, one, one put option and one share of stock is exactly the same as the put, uh, payoff from buying a call option and a bond with a face value equal to the exercise price of the option with the same maturity as the option has expirated. Now let's see why that would be the case. 
So the bond's risk-free. In fact, for, for this, uh, this example, we've got a strike price of 25. So our bond needs to have a face value of 25. And if we buy a bond at time zero, the value of that bond, or the, the value of the bond at time zero is 25. Now this is the expiry. Anyway, so the value of the bond, because it's risk-free, it's basically 25. That's what you're going to get. Now what about, uh, and by the way, this is all at expiry. What is the uh, value of the call option? Well, it's going to the path from the call option is going to be zero right up until you hit that strike price, and then it's going to start climbing one dollar for every dollar the stock price goes up. So that's something we've already talked about today. If you if you bought the call option, that would be your payoff for it. And so if I add that call and that bond together, basically it just lifts that whole hockey stick for the call option, lifts it up by 25. And it turns out it just totally overlays this red line. And the red line, uh, that's also, dang, I'm having trouble today. Um, So if you add those two together, that's the payoff that you get. But what does that payoff also look like? It took me another slide to get this. That's why I was having trouble. That looks identical to the payoff from um, buying a put option and the share. Now, think about this. A put option is really insurance against share price dropping. Does that make sense? And so, just like any insurance, you're going to pay a premium for it, and unless the bad thing happens, then you just lose your premium. But think about this, we're up here, the stock price is high, and uh, every dollar that the stock price drops, our portfolio payoff drops, because that option is out of the money, so the value of it is zero. Does that make sense? If the option's out of the money, then the value is zero. But what if we get down to the strike price? Then, for every dollar that the stock drops, the value of that put option that we purchased increases by one dollar. And so, when this thing is twenty-four, when the stock price is twenty-four dollars, we've dropped a further dollar on the stock price, but we've gained a dollar in the value of the put option. Let me say that one more time. When it falls down to 24, we've lost a, va a dollar value of stock, but we've also gained a dollar, va a dollar of value in the put, and so those two cancel out. When this thing drops down to 15, we've lost a further 10 on the stock, but our option has gained 10 in value. And so basically, this is insurance against the um, stock dropping below $25. And so that's why the payoff looks like this. It's exactly the same as what we saw up here, which was the combination of the call and the bond. So that's where this whole formula comes from. Now, do you need to be able to explain that? No. Do you need to be able to draw these pictures? No. Do you need to be able to use this formula? Yes. Yeah. Yes, very good. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about this formula and some differences you might see. We have, let's go back up here, we've got the big formula, P sub 0 plus S sub 0 equals C sub 0 plus E divided by 1 plus R to the T. Okay, you may also see this written in this way, p sub 0 plus s sub 0 equals c sub 0 plus e divide by e to the r t. What is that? It's not. Yeah. It's the exponential. Oh, yeah. It's the exponential. It's what we use with continuous compounding, right? Yeah, and she found it on our calculator. Okay, so 
That takes you now. You may see it written this way. This is exactly the same as this. And so the difference between these two is just notation. They are identical, and we'll give you the identical result. This one does not allow for continuous compounding. So here's what I would tell you to do. Assume that you've got a problem. And keep in mind that we're working multiple choice questions here, right? You work it this way, and the answer comes out slightly different. It's because they were solving it using this formula, not this formula. But for a multiple choice exam or for a multiple choice homework, this gets you just as close. Or it gets you close enough, right? Does that make sense? The difference isn't going to be all that great. Will it tell us if it's continuously compounded? Uh, yes. But even if it does, I would tell you to go ahead and solve it this way and then choose the closest one because you're only going to be off by a little bit, right? And I may be cruel, but I'm not cruel enough to put both of those on there, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I try not to be that cruel. Questions? This E stuff just seems to blow students' minds. And so that's why I tell you, do this. You'll get close enough, right? Okay. So, we've talked about the value at expiry, uh, but that doesn't give us any way to understand what the value of uh, this the speculative value is. And so what we're trying to do is, if this thing doesn't expire for a while, how can we value that? And the answer is uh, it's called the Black-Scholes pricing model. We'll get to that here in a minute. But the fun thing is, if you look at an American call option, we've got the stock price over here going straight up. The call is out of the money until we have the exercise price, at which point it starts gaining a dollar for every dollar the stock price goes up. By the way, do you think the stock price continues on that, that line keeps going? Just don't be fooled because it, line, it stops on the graph, right? Okay. So that intrinsic value is shown by the green line. But in actuality, what we see the prices going at for these options is the red line, the red line. And the difference between the red line and the green line is the speculative value. The difference between the red line and the green line is the speculative value. So all the formulas we've talked about so far have dealt purely with the uh, the intrinsic value, the call option, or the put option, but now we're saying, well, we need some way to figure out how much is that speculative value. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? It's called the Black-Scholes model. Now let's walk through what these things mean. The call option value is the stock price times and this in D1. Well, we need to know what D1 is. And we go down and D1 is the natural log of the stock price over the strike price plus the risk-free rate plus the variance of returns on the underlying asset divided by two multiplied by T. Ms. Crable, you already have the appropriate look on your face. Okay. If I were teaching a Master's of Science in Finance course if this were PhD. By the way, I had to derive this thing on my uh, comprehensive exam for PhD school. I couldn't do it today on a bet. Uh, but long story short, am I going to make you actually do this formula? No. Um, you could go ahead and breathe out now, it's okay. The, the N is the normal distribution. And we're going to be putting in these different values, D1 and D2. That's going to give you a Z that you plug into the normal distribution table and blah, da, 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 da. And that's how you'd make this work. But once again, this is just an MBA class. It's not MSF. It's not PhD. So we're not going to actually do that. So why do I even bother to tell you about it? And it's because of 
this. It tells us what directions things are going to go based on, uh, prices are going to go based on different things. Let's start with a simple one. As the stock price goes up, the value of the call option goes up. Does that make sense? It makes absolutely sense. As the value of the uh, stock goes up, the value of the call goes up. As the stock price goes up, what happens to the value of the put option? It goes down. By the way, do you think you should have this, this little table written on your note sheet? Absolutely. Now, exercise price. As the exercise price goes up, the value of a call goes down. That also makes sense. And as the exercise price of the put goes up, the value of the put also goes up because there's now a greater chance that this thing's going to be in the money. So, so far, nothing really crazy. The interest rate for the call option, as the interest rate goes up, the value of the call goes up, the value of the put goes down. And then this one, uh, let's, let's skip to number five and then we'll come back to number four. The expiration date. It's positive for both. Can anyone tell me why? As the expiration date gets further out, okay, no, that's going to be the volatility. Is there more opportunity for Yeah, there's more opportunity. And it's too bad she's not here, but one of the things that I asked Ms. Uh, Minnis was could she push out that wedding date? Right? Because that lengthens the time to expiry. It increases the value of the option. Does that make sense? Okay. So the further out in time, the more likely this thing is, if it's a call option, for it to go up, or if it's a put option, for it to go, the stock price to go down. And so that's why it's positive related. Now, let's talk about why volatility is positively related to both. Let's assume that we have our exercise price here. This is a call option. We have our exercise price here. And we have our stock price up here. And it's moving very, very little, very low volatility. What are the chances that this thing is going to really take off? Not much. Not much, right? What if we've got one that's doing this? All I gotta do is keep my eye on it and wait for it to do one of these and sell and come out with more money. Now, given the fact that it's got a greater chance of this thing happening, people are willing to pay more for it. Which would you pay more for? A lottery ticket that had a one in a million chance of winning or a one in a billion chance of winning? Yeah, the one in a million. And there's a whole lot more likelihood that this stock is going to take off, right? And we can see the same thing on the put option. Let's say, in fact, on that call option, I should have been doing this, right, with the strike up here and the stock price down here. But on the put option, in order for me to get money out of this thing, the stock price has to crash below that. Well, if this thing's just cruising along up here, chances of it actually getting into the money, pretty low. But if it's doing one of these jobs, whoop, it's, a, it's entirely possible that this thing will become in the, in the money. And so it's more likely, so people are willing to pay more for that. So we see that the riskier it is, and the longer time the expiry, the greater the chance that this thing is going to become in the money, and therefore the speculative value is higher. Questions? Okay. Now let's talk about uh, the application to corporate finance, which is really what this class is supposed to be about. We say that levered equity is a call option. Equity, the stock. So you own the stock in a company. And what do we mean by levered equity? Mr. Umfleet. Um, that. When we use leverage, what are we doing? I, can't, I don't really know how to explain it, but I like guess stock goes up, you're going to make a bigger percent. Why? What's in our capital structure that makes that possible? Uh, Starts with a D. It's not donuts. Debt! Debt. No. Lever the, 
leverage. So the greater the debt, the greater the leverage. And if you think back to the equity multiplier, it's uh, total assets over total equity. In other words, and this is the equity multiplier, which is our best measure of leverage. As this, so it starts out, if you have no debt whatsoever, the equity multiplier is one. But the more and more debt you add to this thing, the greater and greater this equity multiplier becomes. Okay, so that's what we mean by leverage. Now, if the company has borrowed money, we can think of this as a call option. In other words, the debt holders have sold a call option to the shareholders. So the underlying asset in this case is the assets of the firm. We've been looking at stock option, options on stocks, and uh, those, the underlying asset was the stock itself. But now we're viewing the underlying assets as being the assets of the firm. The debt, uh, the people who buy the debt, what are they basically doing? They're giving the firm money in exchange for a fixed return. And uh, they, so what does the firm do? When it comes time to the maturity of that loan, which is the expiry of this option, the managers of the firm have two choices. They can either pay the debt and keep the assets, or they cannot pay the debt and let the debt holders take the assets. Does that make sense? Okay, so here we are. We've borrowed $100 million. And when the time comes for the debt to be paid, the value of the underlying assets is $150 million. Do we pay off the debt? Yeah, this, is, this call option is in the money by 50 million, right? Because it's only going to, we're going to exercise the option, we're going to pay them their 100 million, which is the strike price, and we are going to have 50 million left over, so we're in the money. What if instead, at the end of all this, the uh, assets are only worth 80 million? Are we going to pay the 100 million in debt? No, we're going to declare bankruptcy and let them take the assets. Does that make sense? And so that's how we can view the, equi the levered equity of the firm as a call option. Okay, now, uh, we could also look at it the other way as a put option, but here's what you need to know out of all this, and, and, and the argument's very similar. Here's what you need to know. What does that mean for the value of, of the, if, if we can look at stock as an option, we can look at some things here. And one of the things that we look at is that volatility of the stock price. If we can model stock as an option, we can actually raise the stock price by undertaking more risky kinds of activities. And we see this. We see this when a firm, let's, in fact, let's roll back to the savings and loans uh, disaster of the 70s and 80s. We had these, these bank-like things called savings and loans. And they made a bunch of bad loans. And so now they're basically getting close to being insolvent. And so what do they try to do? Are you guys familiar with the Hail Mary pass from football? Mr. Scott, what's a Hail Mary pass? Punch it as far as you can, someone Yeah, so here we are. We know we're gonna lose, right? And we've got one guy downfield and, and the quarterback just chucks it and tries to, it's a low probability of success, but if it does happen, you're gonna win. If it doesn't work, have you really lost anything? No, you were going to lose anyway, right? And so this is what the savings and loans did. They found themselves losing with time running out. And so what they did is they launched some Hail Mary passes. In this case, the Hail Mary pass was taking on some extraordinarily risky bets 
that if they paid off, it would save the company. And if they didn't pay off, well, hell, we were going bankrupt anyway. Does that make sense? And so that's what we, we see this uh, option framework for levered stocks. Uh, it has some perverse incentives in that it creates this incentive for people to do this crazy, risky stuff when they find themselves up against the wall. Okay, now, so it's, a, it's helpful in understanding two big business issues, capital budgeting and mergers and diversifications. So let's talk about capital budgeting. Do you think it's possible that a project could have a negative NPV, but it might actually be worth doing because it gives us the value, the option to do something else later. Absolutely. So let's talk about, uh, let's roll back to the original Toyota Prius. This thing came out, I forget what year it was, but it was like uh, when I was in, so you got, about the time you were born. Anyway, it looked like a car from the 1970s. It looked like a car from the 1970s. It was a total piece of crap, except for one thing. It gave Toyota the experience in building this hybrid kind of vehicle. It gave them then the option to launch the second generation Prius, which by the way was a decent car and sold really well. So sometimes from a capital budgeting standpoint, we would say even if something is negative NPV by itself, the value of the option for the next project makes it worthwhile. Another example would be um, movies, sequels. So uh, there's the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I need to, uh, has, has anyone done a good series of sequels lately? Like one, two, three? Because all my examples are from like the 90s, right? The Lord of the Rings, the Saw movies. Yes. Uh, say again? Oh yeah, there we go. Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, I said captains. You said captains, yes. <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean. So if you've seen this show, so basically they did the first one, and how many of those did they do? Four. Okay, now, the first one, by the way, was a hit. And it's my theory that odd-numbered sequels are usually good, and that even-numbered sequels usually suck. Star Trek, the, the movie from 1981, was pretty good. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, sucked. Star Trek III, pretty good. Uh, you could look at the, the Star Wars movies the same way. Now, uh, but, so, why would you do the number two movie? Well, first of all, you, it's positive MPV by itself, right? It's a good franchise. But it also gives you the option to do the third one, which is going to be better. Does that make sense? Fast and Furious is kind of the same way. Say again? Fast and Furious is kind of the same way. I wouldn't know. So... Because <laughs> Vin Diesel actually won the rights to one of his other movies because he did a cameo in the third. Yes, uh, I, I've Furious. heard that. Okay, so basically it gives, uh, and I like that, Fast and Furious is probably more up to date than my example. But Lord of the Rings is still up to date because they have that new TV show. On which I also hear sucks. But on with the story. <laughs> no one interrupted while you were gone. Yeah. Okay, back to, the, back to the story. It gives you these real options, these options to take on stuff down the road. And so that's why we, we might take on a negative MPV project if it gave us the possibility to take on something down the road because that has a positive value. Okay, now let's talk about mergers and diversification. Think about a portfolio. We said, how, how, do you, how do you reduce the risk of your portfolio? Absolute riskiest portfolio you could have would be a portfolio of one stock. You're totally undiversified. How do you reduce the risk a little bit? Diversify. Diversify, you add another stock, right? 
And then we add two more stocks and we keep bringing down that risk until we have nothing left but the market risk. Do you remember that from chapter 11, right? Okay, now it turns out you can do the same thing with a business. If I have one line of business and one line only, that's extraordinarily risky. What if, though, I were to take on a second line of business? Well, I can get rid of some of that risk. And what if I take on a third line of business and so forth? And so the argument that you'll hear people make from mergers and acquisitions is that they're diversifying the cash flows of the firm. Now, that all sounds good. And if you were the sole owner, the sole proprietor of that firm, it would make perfect sense because that's your personal portfolio. However, this argument carries no water for publicly traded firms, and here's why. Do I need these clowns to diversify my portfolio? No, I can do that on my own much more cheaply than they can. Example, what does it cost me to go out and buy the S&P 500 ETF on Charles Schwab? Nothing, right? Because there's no zero commission on ETF. So I go out there and I now suddenly have 500 stocks. Do I need this corporation to go into 500 lines of business? No. And by the way, do you think mergers and acquisitions are expensive? They are. Every time one of these happens, millions of dollars get flushed down the investment bank toilet, right? When it ends up as Ferraris in New York City. So. You don't need these guys to do this. You don't want these guys to do this. Why then are they so interested in diversifying the firm? Any ideas? They're not doing it for the shareholders. We've already talked about that. Okay, so they could be thinking market share. It could be an empire building exercise. But uh, you could do that through related acquisition, right? So we're, we're talking about diverse, uh, conglomerate acquisition here, diversifying the firm. Why would they do that? I'm going to give you a hint. What is the great majority of their wealth composed of? I'm a CEO. I get paid in two ways. I get cash and I get stock. Now, am I allowed to just go out and sell that stock? I might be allowed to, but what kind of signal would it send to the market? That's a bad signal, right? And so you're like, damn, I'm stuck with all this, this Halliburton stock. By the way, I only have seven shares. But I'm stuck with all this Halliburton stock, and uh, you know, I can't diversify my portfolio. Well, hey, if I can't diversify my portfolio, what can I do? diversify the company. Does that make sense? And it's even worse than that because not only are most of their financial assets tied up with that company, 100% of their undiversifiable human capital is also tied up with that company. And so now they have two reasons to want to try to diversify the company. One is to uh, di uh, diversify their financial portfolio, and the other is to reduce the risk of their own human capital that they have invested at the firm. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what does this mean to you? I, I doubt, I, I don't mean this in, in any mean way, but I, it's the probability is low that any of you are going to wind up to be CEO of a huge company. Now, it's not impossible, but just looking at the numbers nationwide, how many MBA students today are going to turn into CEOs? Very low, right? Okay, but how, uh, what, how might you be impacted by this? If you go to a company and they have an employee stock ownership plan, should you participate in it? Let's say that they're going to give you a, just a very slight discount, or they say, well, you can buy it commission free. Should you put your money in the employee stock ownership plan? Ms. Bergner, I think you may have the answer. Say no? She says no, and she's absolutely right. I, was say, I feel like the answer is no. You feel, <laughs> hell yeah. Well, hey, trust your instincts here. Now, the question is why? 
your human capital is 100% invested with the firm, right? You can't diversify that, but what can you diversify? Your, fi yeah, your financial capital, right? Does that make sense? And so I, I saw this all the time in the oil field because the people weren't sophisticated financial thinkers and they, you know, rah, rah, rah about our company. And I was rah, rah, rah too, but I wasn't putting my money on it, right? Except for that time that I bought the options. Anyway, back to the story. Um, what you'd want to do then is make sure you invest in everything but your company, right? And I can give you a very good example of why this is so important. Have you ever heard of Enron? Enron was this big thing when I was in MBA school. And in fact, people did presentations on it, how freaking great it was. And, and then it turned out it was just a big old house of cards. But the employees, most of them, had put all of their retirement savings into Enron stock. Now, when Enron goes belly up, not only are they out of a job, yeah, they have no money either, right? Does that make sense? And so I would tell you, unless they're giving you a really good discount and giving you the option to sell the stock fairly quickly, I wouldn't touch an employee stock ownership plan. They're called ESOPs. Um, when I worked at Walmart, I had one, and it was like once you weren't an employee, the fees were so high. Like it was like thirty dollars a year just to keep the employee stock account open. Oh, after you left? Yeah, after you stopped your job. So it was like if you were to turn, you would want to sell your shares like right away. Yeah. So your earnings would be like eaten up. Yep. So Walmart's an excellent example. Uh, the first, the thirteenth Walmart was built in my hometown, nineteen sixty-seven. One of my dad's coworkers' wives went to work there as a cashier and she got into the employee stock ownership plan and ended up being a multimillionaire as a result. And, and all she ever did was run a register at Walmart. Her name was Cheryl. Now, the question is, go ahead. Sorry, I have an example. Oh, okay. Well, I'll finish this one, then you can. Now, and, and so hindsight tells us, oh yeah, the employee stock ownership plans are great. And this is how you're gonna get rich. Now, here's the thing I wanna tell you. Sam Walton went bankrupt twice before he got Walmart to work. What if you were in the same mode of thinking with his first two ventures? You've been squat out a lot. Yes? Yes, my example is Starbucks. Okay. When I first started, um, you know, they started with one store from Seattle, and then when they got, like, into the chain, they introduced something called Beanstalk, but the employees were uh -huh. and they would give it to them for a discount, and then when it really took off, there was a lot of stories of employees selling this stock for 100% of profit, and they would like buy cars and houses and things, mm -hmm. and pay off their loans and stuff. Mm -hmm. And once again, looking at hindsight at those kinds of things, you're like, wow, that's freaking great. Everyone should do that. But for every coffee shop that opened in Seattle, how many became Starbucks? One. In fact, for every coffee shop that opened nationwide. And it cracks me up today. People say, oh yeah, coffee houses are the way to get rich. And so you see it in every town. There's like people think, oh yeah, I got this great concept for a coffee house. And so then they start coming up with it. Some of them survive, but only as like one. And, and maybe they make a fair living for their, their owners. But are any of them likely to become like Starbucks? No. So would I... Even if I were back in time and I didn't know any better, if I were Starbucks in the day, I wouldn't have been one of those people because I would say, phew, I'm not putting my money into this. This is probably going to go belly up, right? We do know what? 95% of small businesses fail in the first year. It's, it's horrible. It may not be as high as 95, but it's huge, right? So does that make sense? I saw a coffee shop the other day. I'm just driving by, and it was called Farmhouse Coffee. And I turned to my wife, and I said, whoever named that, obviously never drank any coffee in any farmhouse that I've ever been in because it was always the cheapest, most rotten coffee. <laughs> Maxwell House, even worse. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Folgers was like a step up. That's why the city stopped the seven brews from building any more locations because they put up so many locations all at the same time, and if, like, they all fail, then they've got all 
these custom made buildings that are just empty. Yeah. And so, and this is something, I, my wife and I took some students to a, a field trip to a Central States Industrial. And they were talking about growth. And the guy said something really interesting that I think you guys need to know. And that is, there is such a thing as growing too fast. So, this seven brew coffee, what should they do? Start out, prove the concept, yeah. and then maybe try a second store. And if that still works, then try a third store, instead of going whoop, all yeah, at once. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the example here locally is Hertz Donut. Do you guys know Hertz Donut? Okay, so Hertz Donut comes out, and by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's H-U-R-T-S, and it's the joke where they, you know, you want a Hertz Donut, and then they smack you, and they say, Hertz Donut. Okay, you guys didn't know about that? Uh, that was very popular in the 70s. Okay, back to the, or at least when I was a kid, you know, people just beat me for no reason. <laughs> back to the story. So, they, they come out with this concept, Hertz Donut, and they, and they say what it's going to be. And I'm like, that sucks. That's not going to work. And I also, when the, the TV show Friends came out in 1994, I said, that's not going to make it past one season. So I've been wrong twice now, right? <laughs> okay, so Hertz Donut, they, they've got this uh, amazing weird donuts. It doesn't seem like uh, something that would take off, but it did. Now, did they immediately go out and open eight more locations? No. Well, they did. They opened another location. And they try for that for a while. And they say, yeah, this thing does have holding power. And so now I think, I don't know how many locations they've got now. But they're also starting to talk about franchising. But uh, it's important not to grow too fast because you can get overextended financially. And you're not really for sure if the, the local market could absorb that much. Does that make sense? Are they franchised now? They're working on it if they haven't already. one in my hometown in Colorado. Oh, yeah, then they're franchised. Yeah. That's interesting that it's grown. That's so interesting. Yeah. Two years ago. It'd be interesting to go out there and try the donuts. Field trip. <laughs> <laughs> that was like Andy's right after we moved here. Put one in like where we used to live in Florida. And then we moved to Colorado. 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 And then we moved to so if they're diversifying only to, so it just, so remember earlier we, we talked about uh, why we would keep uh, companies from being able to merge because it would, the bondholders of the safe part of the firm, basically their yield maturity was going to go up, the value of their bonds was going to go down. It's just a transfer from the um, bondholders to, from the safe bondholders to the risky bondholders. Well, here what we're seeing is that it's transferring wealth from the stockholders to the bondholders because if you diversify through a merger, your company is now safer, the yield to maturity is lower, and uh, remember we said that the more volatile it was, the more uh, valuable it was from an option perspective, but now the bonds are worth more because they're not as risky. So it's just a transfer of wealth. And we, I already mentioned that second bullet point. So if, there, if the management's goal is to maximize stockholder wealth, then mergers for reasons of diversification should not occur. For one thing, you're lowering down that uh, volatility, which we said gives the option more value. Uh, number two, you're having to pay those transactions fees to do these mergers and acquisitions. And we know that those come straight out of the shareholders' pockets. And so there's a couple of reasons not to do diversification or mergers for reasons of diversification. Okay. Now we talked about the so I think it's got these we've already kind of talked about this. You should so under in theory, you should never um, accept a low or negative or a lower negative MPV project. You should always accept a high MPV project. But what if the low MPV project was really risky and would increase the volatility of the underlying assets? From an option perspective then, you've increased the value of the shares. And so it might make sense to do that if you're trying to boost the share price. On the other hand, what if you have a really high MPV project, but 
it's going to make the firm very safe and that volatility is going to fall way down, the option value of that equity is going to drop, maybe more than the value of that high NPV. Now, the only way this works is if the firm is highly leveraged. If the firm is highly leveraged, it's the only way this works. If you have an all stock firm, you definitely don't do this because you don't have anyone to put those assets to if things go bad. So I've covered all that. Okay, so we talked about this. Oh, another example. Producing the iPhone gives the ability to produce the Apple Watch. Does that make sense? And so you see products that have follow-ons like that. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the iPhone wasn't a positive MPV project by itself, but then once we start getting into these other things, then we start to have positive MPV, and so it's worth doing. I'm sorry I did that a little out of order, but I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover as far as options and the real world. If you're a manager and you're trying to maximize shareholder wealth, do you diversify the firm through mergers and acquisitions? No. If you're an employee, do you buy shares in the employee stock ownership plan? No. Questions? <laughs>